All right. Well, welcome everyone to um, Science Division Live. My name is Erin Baxter. I am the Acting Curator of Anthropology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And today, if you guys have about 10 minutes, I would love to show you some of my research um, from Aztec Ruins National Monument. And then at the end, uh, Memory will pop back on and um, she will. we will take your questions in any form that they come from. Um, and we'll be done by about 1230. So I hope that you will stay long enough to enjoy a little lunch and a little um, science bite. Um, so I wanna start off with this principle that a lot of us um, are taught. And that is that museums are these ghastly charnel houses of murdered evidence that often we think of museums only as what's up front, what we see in exhibits and the like. And really lots of things are downstairs and in cases and in boxes um, that are studied by scholars all over the world and by and can sometimes be seen by public. And this is um, what I derive some of my research from. Archaeology, you often think about archaeology as going out and digging. And I didn't do this. I am, I, I'm fond of telling everyone I'm the laziest archaeologist in the world because I never, uh, I never got my knees dirty to do this research. But what I want to talk about is this site that some of you may have heard of. It's called Aztec Ruins National Monument. Uh, um, it a, it's not, has nothing to do with the Aztec people who came much later in central Mexico. It was sort of a misnamed. These are ancestral Pueblo people. The site's called Aztec because early farmers didn't know and they just kind of, it's in Montezuma County, it's all wrong. Anyway, but it's by Farmington, New Mexico. And back in the day, it got a lot of press and then it got a little overshadowed. So nobody's really looked at it for about a hundred years, um, even though it's a national park and the like. Um, and to give you an idea of where it is, uh, it's right here sort of in the Northwest corner of New Mexico. And it's associated with a site called Chaco Canyon, just to the South, which was this huge, uh, monumental sort of um, multiple great house site that's in New Mexico. Here it is, it is um, that's Pueblo Benito, sort of the largest and best known. This is a monument that everyone should go to if they have a chance. Um, and it's it's characterized by this sort of overbuilt, beautiful um, corn veneer masonry, large oversized rooms, beams that are brought in from a long time, uh, from a far away. And then about 1120 or 1140, people just left. Um, they left this, this area and they moved north. And uh, lots of them, lots of those folks ended up settling at this site called Aztec, which is a number, another sort of place with lots of great houses, actually, at least four of them. Um, and here's Aztec on the west. It's just one of many buildings. Oh, that didn't play. It's uh, one of many buildings that, um, that was excavated by this guy named Earl Morris. Um, and here he is in 1916, um, an early selfie. I, he actually timed this. This has been unpublished, but this is uh, his one of his first days on the dig at Aztec Ruins uh, National Monument. And he dug there on and off for about six seasons. Uh, he was interrupted by World War II and the like, or World War I and the like. Um, but here he is working and he did a lot of work. He excavated about 75% of this massive 400 room building. And he did it with carts and people and unskilled labor. And he dumped a lot of the soil into the local river. And he wasn't always great about taking notes. Uh, in fact, there's a day's notes on the bottom right um, that he wasn't sort of uh, verbose about. Now, a modern archaeologist, if you've ever read anything that we've ever written, we dig a layer of soil that's this thick and we'll write, uh, you know, a good 4,000 words on it or the like. We're very verbose. Um, and he wasn't. And that was just, he was a man of his era. Um, and so to give you an example, he wrote a couple of monographs. And in these great big rooms that you saw um, uh, Steve Lexon walking through a minute ago, those great big rooms that he dug from the top to the bottom that are as, you know, as big as this building or as tall as this building. Um, he wrote about 306 words per uh, per one. And then like, if you look at the bottom of this, the details of which will be given in a future publication, that was a repeated sort of phenomenon as well. So he always said, I'm gonna get back to it. And he never quite did. Um, so this has left archeologists a little bum fuzzled and perplexed as to how to sort of really learn about this building that really got excavated a hundred years ago, but didn't get written up as well as it could. And the, sa the saving grace is that what Morris was ahead of his time about was that he took photographs and he took lots of photographs. And because of this, and he didn't publish them, he just sort of tucked them away into his place up in Boulder. Um, but when he passed away, his photographs went to the American Museum of Natural History and the CU Museum of Natural History for future scholars to sort of dig out and find. Um, and what we're finding is that Aztec ruins doesn't look like it did a thousand years ago, but it doesn't even look like it did, you know, a few years ago. So I took this photo in 2012. This is the northwest corner of one of the buildings called Aztec East. And I found a photograph of it just from, um, you know, 100 years before that, and how intact this building had become, and how over the course of this many years, 
um, this building has begun to deteriorate dramatically. And the Park Service is trying to sort of stay this decay, but it's not always working. So these aren't sort of, you know, preserved sort of moments in time. And there are other photographs that show us things that have just since disappeared, like a Chacoan Road that's now under an airport at Farmington. Um, so there's the there's the road. Here's a photograph from uh, from a newspaper from the 1920s showing this 30 foot wide, 10 meter wide road that's that that is no more, but still was one of these important links to the Chaco regional system. Um, a, a close up of these offerings, um, these important sorts of objects that were put into the support posts of, of Kiva, these ritual spaces, um, and what you can find in those. We don't know. Um, in the context of these sorts of things, but now we know by looking at them that we know that these are figure eight beads and these have now been studied by archaeologists to figure out how they were strung together and what they would have looked like. So sort of the notion of the seen and the unseen objects, all from the photographs. Um, and then there are just numerous sorts of, of photos that uh, that show excavation that when you sort of zoom in and look at, you see features, you see artifacts, you see things that are not there anymore, like plaster with decorations of anthropomorphic figures. And you keep going and you keep going. And I'm purposely speeding this up because to give you an idea of the wealth of information from these photographs, if they're each worth a thousand words, then we have lots more to say about Aztec. And uh, to give you a sense of this, I put it up to one second per photograph, and if I line them all up together, we've got 36 more minutes to go. So there's lots to look at and still to learn from about Aztec. What got me started was uh, this photograph that, uh, that Earl Morris took in 1917, and I came across this when I was uh, a student at, at CU Museum at the Henderson Museum up in Boulder. And I said, I've been there before. I think I've seen that. And of course, there it was. I had visited um, just the summer before. and. What I saw didn't look like what was there. Um, features had been covered up, objects were no longer there and the like. And I, what, we, what we also saw was the, an analog, analogy to sort of Pueblo Benito, that there might have been a different roofing structure that we were no longer aware of because for the, during the preservation process of the Kiva, those features had been covered over. So there I thought that this is just one photograph. Imagine if we looked at all of them. And that's what I did over the course of the next few years. I looked at notebooks and photos, and this, I had to go to five different states to find these things. And in them, you can find wonderful sort of um, insights into things that have long since disappeared, um, sort of paper evidence that the artifacts or the objects, or in some cases, the human remains are, have been repatriated or, or put back in the ground. But we still know about them because Morris or somebody else uh, described it. And so I just went around and compiled all these things and made new maps and new notes to tell new stories. And here's an example of, of, a, of a burial that was described in a back room that is long that has long since disappeared, but we know the information because a National Park Service employee wrote it down. And I made this great big database and did what's called multimodal analysis to try to link oral history and photos and text across time and space and see if we could pull these threads together to weave something more complex. Uh, so for example, some of them were got to be a little bit even ridiculous. Like here's a photo of a room in Aztec taken by Earl Morris. I don't know where that room is. I don't know why there's a kid digging on a site in 1916 or 1917, but in the letters, I do know that Ole Owens, who was one of the workers for Earl Morris, had his nephews come and visit because he was um, uh, working at it. They were helping him work on this chicken farm. And because of that, Ole could only work in September and October of that year. I know Ole was paid based upon the pay stips, slips. And I know that's probably Ole's nephew. And if you zoom in, uh, you can see the boots of this one guy over here. He's got sort of unusual boots. And then if you sort of zoom back out, there's Ole working on, on some pottery. And if you zoom in, he's got that same kind of unusual high heel. So because of that, I could figure out Ole his nephew, they're working in September and October of 1917. I know where Earl Morris is working during those time periods. I can narrow it down to these six rooms. I can go back and I can match the masonry and there it is. There's the room. And so now it doesn't look anything like it used to, but I can match those data together and bring about more information about that particular room and what was found in it, when it dates to, what it used to look like, how the Park Service has modified it in the last hundred years, and what it tells about the, along with 399 other rooms about Aztec. Um, and we can do this again and again, just to give you a few examples, Kiva D, a round uh, 
structure for for that was ritualized there's some photographs never published and if you zoom in you can see that there's a pot in a niche and there's pottery and all of a sudden even though we don't have radiocarbon or or uh, tree ring dates for that room we can date it based upon the pottery and things that we don't have anymore and we can find kind of rough notes that morris took and we can even find sort of, you know, other sort of rough photographs of them during the excavation, how high the bench was, what kind of plastering was on the walls. Um, we even found in this one case a map, and I matched up the numbers that are on this map with the, with the cataloging card, which was in a different state, and figured out and how to sort of remake this map so that we could know what bowls and jars and pitchers and um, animal bones and the like were on the floor and reconstruct the whole thing. So we all of this again from from a library from an archive from a computer screen no work and even the text is really important so there's aztec west the map of that big building and on and, and morris road to 1990 on the east wing fire had, had consumed four or five of the rooms and that's what he published but what he wrote to his boss He'd, mis he'd misplaced it, he'd, he'd misspelled, he'd misspoken. Of the East Wing fire had consumed the ceilings of all but four or five of the rooms. Changing an, a, an outbreak of four or five rooms, you know, a 1% phenomenon into something that was much a much more significant conflagration, possibly signaling an, an untimely end or a purposeful burning of this building that is telling about the sort of structural patterns there. So really sort of super interesting. There's even letters that are even from 1934, decades after he'd finished um, digging, and a botanist from Idaho said, hey, Earl, have you ever found any sweet corn in all your digging? And Earl said, who had a 40-year career of digging, I've never found anything but field corn, with the exception of one time in room 133 at Aztec. And he'd never written about it, he'd never published it, he never photographed it, but I went and I found it in the American Museum of Natural History. Um, he said he never he never recalled seeing anything, but there it is. And so I found it in, in 2012 and had it radiocarbon dating. That's the oldest sweet corn in the world, all from the archives, which is pretty cool. So um, just to, to round out, there are still so many sort of photographs to, 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 to learn from and to see and to explore this early excavation. Um, and every time I look at this, even though I'm going slowly blind doing it, um, I see something new and extraordinary that I've never seen before. And I sort of rethink how this Pueblo would have looked and how these people would have constructed their world a thousand years ago. And for that, I am incredibly grateful for the archives and for the work of Earl Morris. Though even though I would have liked him to write a bit more, um, some of this information is still at our fingertips and we can reconstruct it because quite rightfully national parks and, and descendant communities are reluctant to have sort of invasive and destructive work done. So this is what we have to work with. And if we do so respectfully, I think there's lots of information that can still be learned from photographs like these in archives across the world states anyway i should say so i say i return to this quote museums are ghastly charnel houses of murdered evidence to you mr petrie i say no no fie on you that museums are in some ways not always but in some ways are sort of our saviors and wonderful places to continue to do research on on elements that we can't do in other places in other ways um so with that i would like to thank these institutions for their their help and i would love to take your questions if you have a moment to ask them Awesome presentation, Erin, like always. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Memory. I work in the marketing department here at the museum, and I'm just popping in, like always, to read your questions to our presenter. Um, and I am monitoring Facebook and YouTube, so just feel free to drop those questions. Um, I hadn't seen any just yet, so I'm just going to ask a few of my own as we wait. Um, we do have some comments. We have one from Kim who says, amazing work, Erin. And another one from Aaron Cross who says, fantastic investigative work. Thank oh, thanks. You. So I was wanting to know one thing first is where can we find the oldest um, uh, ear of corn? Where is that? Is that in a museum somewhere? Where, where are we holding that? Yes, the, the oldest ears of corn um, are not sweet corn. So we, we feed field corn to cows. It's, it's not very sweet unless you get it in a really finite time period it kind of tastes a little bit sweet but we have 
genetically manipulated corn to have, you know, what we like at 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But the oldest field corn is from Mexico. And then there are some sort of off uh, shoots in South America. But um, it's about 4,000, 5,000 years old. Uh, maybe even older. And then we watch it, we see it genetically sort of spread up through uh, Western Mexico and into Arizona and New Mexico and finally percolating out. But the story mm -hmm. of sweet corn is that there was a blight um, in, uh, in New England when white people, Anglos, were sort of living up there and they um, began to raid the Iroquois folks. Who had who had left behind a pot on the on the stove that had corn in it, and that was the first time that um, non-indigenous people had had corn, and the Anglo's took it back and they began to grow it and liked it and began manipulating it. But uh, that was still field corn. So this idea of sweet corn, which is less robust, tastier, might be an indication of someone who has a little higher status to be able to have such a delightful sort of thing in their on their palate. In their diamond. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, I see some questions coming in. We have some on Facebook. One from Diane who asks, what happened to the wall designs over time? What happened? Okay. Diane, I might be, I might be confused. The wall design. Oh, sorry. The petro, the designs on the, got it. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here's having some caffeine. So <laughs> what happened was when Morris dug that, he wanted the, the, the building to be a museum. And so he just fenced it off and left it open to the elements. And because of that, it was out in the, in the, in the freezing temperatures. It might've been protected from the rain, but people came by and took, took things. So it has mostly disappeared. So the ones that, uh, that I showed you are gone, but there are still a few wall designs that depict uh, triangles that are thought to be mountains and the like that are in the interior rooms that are walled off, still have their original 1200 year old um, roofs intact and have since been doubly roofed by the park service who are protecting it and keeping it for future generations. Excellent question, Diane. Yes, we have another one from Kim who asks, will there be any public, dis public displays of this work? Yes. Okay. So I, I, I've written my dissertation. Don't read it. But the CU Museum of Natural History and the Chaco Research Archive have now taken some of my scans and added to their own. And now all of these photographs are accessible online. So if you go to the CU Museum of Natural History and scroll around until you find the Morris Archive, you can look at any one of those photos for as long as you would like. Awesome. Ooh, that was a great question. We have another comment. Great presentation and enthusiasm. Thank you for watching, Vicky. Nice. Just making sure I haven't left anyone out. But just in case we miss any more, I'm just going to, oh, here's one. Just coming from Richard who asks, is there a way the public can help search through old images? That's a great question. I, I think there is. I haven't set up anything like a, a crowdsource research. Um, I, I, I don't see why we couldn't do something yeah. like that. Um, yeah, I think I think that'd be a great idea. But there's wonderful, I mean, archivists and museum uh, curators and collections managers are doing these great jobs of digitizing these these um, these collections and making them accessible to more and more people. And anything that you can do along that lines to support that endeavor would be fantastic. And heck, email me. Yeah, we can. I can I'll send you some photos and we can. We can keep playing at it. It's like I was telling memory because she has the best name for this. It's like the <laughs> best game of memory. Like I have, I read this in 1933, and then there's a report from 1917. It could it be the same room? And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's why I have gray hair. But it really is kind of a rewarding sort of way of looking at at these little bits of data. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> and then I wonder, and if I don't see any more questions, we can let this be our last one. But I wonder, is there anything? that you've discovered so far that has just been um, something that's really stuck with you that's just amazing um, that you'd like to share? Oh, there's lots. Um, yeah. One was uh, that through um, sort of a photograph in one room, we saw bits of wood sort of scattered all over the place and I couldn't figure out, they were cut pieces of wood and it was with some matting and the like and I couldn't figure out what it was and they were, photographed in 1917 and then they kind of stayed over and they got photographed again in 1918 and I pulled them out and they kind of fit together and what happened was is that that Morris found out that it was a really early wooden cradle board for a little kid and it was uh put into the corner of this room and um I it was just such a sort of a, a moment of oh this is how they 
they they they cared for their their little people and it, it and that was still intact and often we don't see sort of children in the archaeological record and i thought that was kind of oh, extraordinary and special yeah yeah awesome awesome well how about we end it there um and if you'd like Erin, i can um if uh drop your email in the chat absolutely um anybody who um well richard who may want to just help search through some some images um you can you can reach out to Aaron about that i'll be sure to drop that but other than that thank you all so much for joining thank us thank you Aaron. thank you um, memory thanks Tim. we will be right back here next thursday with another episode of science vision live at 12 o'clock and we'll see you then thank you all